Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Center for the Study of the Middle East's uh, lecture this afternoon. Uh, as I hope everybody knows, we have two co-sponsors, as Ms. Wiebeck reminds me, which is the Inter-Asian and Uralic uh, National Resource Center, and also the uh, study for the uh, study, Center for the Study of Global Change uh, here at uh, IU. Uh, we're always delighted when we can partner with some of our fellow uh, centers uh, on campus. I'm delighted uh, to host uh, Professor uh, Ayubi this afternoon. Dr. Dela Ayubi has taught sociology, English, French, world literature, and Islamic studies, as well as other liberal arts courses at Martin University, Butler University, and Washington State University. She uh, has worked for the Indiana Herald, where she published more than 100 articles. She's also served as a national educational advisor for the United Nations Development Program, the UNDP, uh, in Afghanistan. And she's also served on the faculty um, uh, at uh, Washington State University Extension in Afghanistan. In addition, she served as a diplomat, uh, acting as first secretary, working as first secretary in the Embassy of Afghanistan in Islamabad. Uh, her book, Nikki's Honor, which is what gathers us here uh, this afternoon, became a bestseller on Amazon.com when first published uh, and has been used in several courses at multiple universities. Uh, perhaps not her greatest distinction, but one nonetheless we're proud to claim is that uh, Dr. Ayubi has a master's degree from uh, one of our constituent uh, uh, members, uh, that is the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Cultures, uh, as well as uh, multiple other degrees, including a PhD from Preston University. Uh, she is the recipient of the International uh, uh, Women's Award in 2006 for Distinguished Performance by a uh, Woman Diplomat. She's worked in Pakistan and Afghanistan and authored another book on education for Afghan, for Afghani refugee, uh, for Afghan refugee girls. She is currently adjunct professor at Butler University in Indianapolis. It is my pleasure to ask you to welcome uh, Professor Leila Ayu. Welcome. Thank you for the great introduction. I'm very humble. And uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, Salam alaikum. Alaikum salam. And good afternoon. I'm going to talk about uh, honor killing, which is uh, Honestly, disturbing uh, many, many cultures. It's not happening only in Afghanistan, Pakistan, or India. It's happening all around the world, even in Italy, in, uh, also in the United States. But they don't call it honor killings. They call it uh, different uh, names. Uh, before I start, I just met one of my students uh, yesterday, and she finished my book, and she came and told me, Laila, can you believe it? This uh, uh, story is happening in my own family. Uh, her mother's uh, boyfriend raped her 11 years old uh, sister. By the age of 12, uh, she had a little child. She's American. And she said, uh, uh, we don't kill her. But uh, she already died because uh, psychologically she's uh, not uh, capable even to take care of uh, her little child. And see, these things are happening all around the world. Okay. Uh, before I start to talk about uh, the topic of my book, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, Afghanistan where the history is happening. Uh, Afghanistan is a country in South Asia. It's, we are uh, seeing uh, when it's the benefit. Sometimes we are in the South Asia, and uh, sometimes we are in Middle East. Uh, population of three, 32 million. Capital is uh, Kabul. Uh, I'm from Kabul, and languages are Pashto and Farsi. <coughs> In this uh, flag of Afghanistan, it's a beautiful flag. And also this is a uh, map of Afghanistan. Uh, really, map of Afghanistan shows that Afghanistan is uh, this in the center of uh, Asia. It's the heart of the Asia. 
Sometimes my students at Butler University or Martin University ask me why Americans are very interested in Afghanistan. I said probably not because uh, it have uh, lots of uh, mine and uh, lately they found lithium in Afghanistan and uh, it's full of uh, other mine and precious uh, mines like emerald, uh, rubies, uh, etc. And we have a mountain of lapis lazuli and also the geography location. Uh, if you see the north part um, of Afghanistan is located uh, with the former Soviet Union. Uh, we have uh, in this side Iran and also we have uh, Pakistan and we have a touch with China. And of course if Americans are in Afghanistan they can have eyes on Iran, on Pakistan, on China and on former Soviet Union. Uh, this is the map of Afghanistan and it's still it is very amazing. Um, actually, I came, uh, we came as a political refugee to the United States 30 years ago. And sometimes I'm telling my students that I'm more Hoosier than you are. <laughs> and uh, sometimes the students, some people even uh, at the university, they ask me, did you come by boat? I said, uh, I think uh, when you see the map of Afghanistan, I came by airplane. And the reason I'm going to show you these pictures, see the date, 1928, and see Queen of Afghanistan was wearing sleeveless. Okay. Uh, that's, I'd like for you to remember the dress of Queen. And this is the uh, late King of Afghanistan, King Zahir Shah, and this is her uh, wife, his wife, uh, Queen Omaira, uh, pretty much uh, European, uh, in westernized dress and hair set. In 1962, we had the Girl, Sco uh, Girl Scout. And also this another uh, Girl Scouts, uh, my school in Kabul, Afghanistan. And this is 1950s. Uh, Afghan people were uh, pretty much modern. They were listening to um, music uh, for, um, Western musics, and this is also Afghan Ariana, was a modern stewardesses and educated in Europe and United States. And also in Afghanistan, we are in a mosaic of different nationalities and different languages. If you see, these are not like foreigner. We have blue eyes, uh, green eyes, uh, and blonde uh, hair, with Pashtuns uh, and also with Tajiks. And uh, I just met an Afghan gentleman yes, since I came 30 years ago. But still, I have very close connection. And this is the, my time, uh, 1970s uh, at the university. I came from the era where, uh, when miniskirts was in style. Um, I was not culture shocked when I came to the United States. But when I went back after 26 years, I was culture shocked. Because at, the, at my university, I saw um, students who came from Pakistan, they had the Punjabi clothes. The one who came from Iran, they had Chadar Namaz. And the girls also were wearing burqa. Even uh, it was after the time of the Taliban, but still they were afraid because pockets of Taliban still existed around. In 1960s, we have, uh, like all other countries, graduations uh, in caps and gowns. In 1970s, uh, um, people from Afghanistan, especially in Kabul, uh, they are in... Uh, are very much into um, style and mode and fashion. And Vogue magazine in Paris, they hire them uh, for uh, kind of for designers or to making clothes. And these are Afghan girls uh, were posing for Vogue magazines. They were very famous in that time. And also Afghan, uh, we call it uh, Pustin. Uh, it was very famous. 
Actually, 1970s was kind of high peak in Afghanistan, not only with other areas, <coughs> they uh, based on many reports. Kabul University was uh, on top in the region. Okay, this is the time. Uh, probably some of you remember that Cold War between uh, United States and uh, former Soviet Union. And the best place was uh, to buffer Afghanistan. And present, uh, of course, uh, people became, majority of people became against the uh, co communist puppet government, and United States uh, helped the people who were opposed them. And uh, we called them Mujahideen. And Mujahideen, of course, with the help of Mujahideen, uh, United States was uh, able to kick the Russian out of Afghanistan. And the most important things what happened, the communism regime fell down. Okay. But uh, what happened when the United States uh, won the Cold War? They just turned their back on Afghanistan. They left, but they left uh, all machine guns, stingers, and, uh, what uh, they had uh, for uh, fighting Russian, they just left it in Afghanistan. People took a hand on them, and uh, power struggle started. Warlords came, became in opium production, increased. Uh, in Afghanistan, after Colombia was number one of, in production of uh, opium, which unfortunately still is. Okay, of course, killing uh, everything <coughs> happened. But the, the most uh, damages Russian did to Afghanistan, they killed uh, as much as they could uh, young men. And we had uh, thousands, even millions, uh, women without uh, husband. And these are all. Uh, women's uh, widow from the Soviet Union invasion. You will be surprised, the majority of these women uh, were doctors, teachers, nurses, engineers. Okay. And what happened after uh, the time of uh, Mujahideen? Um, Taliban took over. And when Taliban took over, uh, the first thing they did, they closed uh, <coughs> schools for girls. And they didn't let the girls and women go and work outside. And also the position of women was uh, in the back of the car. And uh, actually women became kind of uh, uh, lower than second-hand citizen. Some of uh, actors and actresses <coughs> or uh, <coughs> high position people, they came uh, to help Afghan refugees, uh, like one of them, was Angelina Julie. When I was uh, working as a diplomat uh, in Islamabad, um, the UNHCR uh, high commissioner invited uh, uh, Angelina Julie, and also with a, a few times uh, they invited us. And this time I didn't uh, write my book. I didn't know about it. To get connected with her and um, kind of make a voice on the silence of people who got hurt and violence, uh, saw violences. Okay. And during the time, uh, you see probably a lot of pictures <coughs> like that. And this is the time of uh, 2001, uh, with the help of uh, United States and allies, uh, they kind of appointed uh, President Karzai um, as the president uh, of uh, Afghanistan. And people, after the fall of the Taliban, they are very happy. But still, they don't take the burqa off because um, they are scared. And also, burqa was uh, before in Afghanistan. People, it was um, some people's choice. Like uh, young girls, they have bad hair day. They put on burqa. <laughs> but uh, sometimes the tradition, some people like it was family tradition that uh, women and girls need to wear burqa. 
and uh, this is my childhood friend when the uh, new president came she became the um, uh, general secretary of red crescent okay when i was uh, the reason i put this picture because i looked good in this picture that <laughs> President uh, Karzai came and he had interview with many people and uh, they, this is uh, the gentleman is from BBC uh, asked him uh, about the situation of women in Afghanistan and he said uh, see we right now we have diplomats we have uh, re people repatriated like had education in different countries and now they are working in Afghanistan and of course there are sometimes danger for them, but uh, they were so much in love with their country, they accepted this danger and work. Okay. This is our new president. Um, he used to be a professor at the George Washington University. Okay. Now, we had a little uh, information about Afghanistan before uh, in 1960s, 1970s, and then we saw after the civil war and after the, during the Taliban. Uh, the first thing, uh, when my, uh, I'm having a speech at the universities or schools, uh, my students ask me the definition of uh, honor killing. What's the definition of honor killing? It is the traditional practice in some countries of killing a family member who is believed to have brought shame on the family. And uh, to be honest, uh, before I, after I read my book, then people uh, actually I wrote my book only for to my classes based on their questions, and uh, because in one chapter we had the honor killing and murder. And students ask me, uh, honor killing uh, has been happening in Afghanistan. <coughs> when I came to United States 30 years ago, I was uh, a little younger and I didn't pay attention to this terminology. If I knew like uh, some of the uh, students are, were killed uh, or uh, they, uh, they suicided or something happened to them, uh, I didn't, have the, didn't know the relation of that. Uh, myself, I grew up in Kabul. We didn't have that prejudice between, uh, uh, like, uh, if a girl became pregnant, uh, she will be die. But pretty much we respected. Looks like uh, this is the way we should not do it. And uh, <coughs> I didn't have. I'm not an expert of honor killing because I just wrote the story. My student asked me, and uh, I went uh, home, and I have my mother who's eighties five years old, I asked him, honor killing happened in Afghanistan? She said, yes, it happened in Afghanistan, but not uh, during, the, like, during the time of Taliban to be headed in public or something. But it's still, she said, killing is killing. Doesn't matter you kill a person with cotton or you kill a person uh, uh, with a sword. Then, uh, after uh, many questions, I went to uh, the little research especially from the Oxford Handbook of Gender, Sex, and Crime, I pulled together some as essential grounding for this topic. Okay. Can I have a um, volunteer to read this loud? <coughs> yes. Honor, killing. <clears throat> Honor killings are an extreme form of domestic violence. Most involve young, single, female victims. It is motivated by the desire to restore a social reputation that has been damaged by a girl or a woman of the family. Okay. Right, so yes. The absence of reliable country-level data makes it impossible to ascertain the exact frequency of honor killings. Recent estimates suggest that there may be as many as 5,000 per year. Yeah, but actually we don't know. It is likely that the majority of perceived transgressions of honor do not provoke a murder. Uh, research in a number of countries with people who differ in their religious affiliations finds that premarital sexual relations 
and out of wedlock pregnancies <coughs> are often dealt with non-violently, mostly by negotiating compensation or marriage, despite strict honor codes. Yeah, in uh, my book, I have some example of that. Like uh, it's not they don't kill, but there are some other alternatives. Okay, this is my favorite part because as soon my students at the universities and even some high schools they invite me to talk about this, uh, they are doing it looks like a relation giving relations between uh, Islam and uh, uh, honor killing, but uh, actually. Uh, honor killing existed before Islam. It's a they call honor killing or a pre-Islamic tribal tradition, in an extrajudicial punishment that is not part of uh, Sharia. In uh, Middle Eastern countries, there are not only Muslim people. There are communities of uh, Jew and Christian that are also practicing honor killing. Am I right, Professor? <laughs> In uh, the book I'm teaching uh, at Butler University calls the Penguin Atlas of Women in the World. And can't, uh, okay, I have a, uh, a map. I see the countries in light purple. Uh, that means uh, on a killings uh, happening uh, are happening. But dark purple, it's uh, honor killings are <coughs> happening on regular basis, which shows India, Afghanistan, Iran, Turkey, Egypt. And I'm uh, very surprised uh, that I don't see it in Saudi Arabia, but I see it in Oman. Maybe this is because of the very strict rule of Islamic if they caught someone, do bring shame on the family, they immediately cut off the head. And uh, like uh, after I asked my mother, then she uh, told me the story. Um, like uh, Nikki's honor is uh, not a fiction; it's a real uh, story, uh, which is about a beautiful Pashtun <coughs> village girl who became entangled in a series of events um, that uh, brought uh, shame uh, to their family. And, but she tolerated all the punishment and everything. Even at then, she was died. But still, she didn't want to tell her mother about this horrible event. <coughs> uh, I'll stop here. If you have any question, uh, Usually, like uh, as I told you, I wrote my book only for my two classes. Uh, then uh, I saw my uh, it went a little beyond. Okay. Uh, hi, Dark Rain. Hi. Dark Rain is a very famous author who wrote about uh, <coughs> Native Indian woman. Please welcome. And uh, then, uh, when I'm talking about in my classes, my students already had the, the book. Or other universities, the uh, teachers already had the uh, students. And they can ask me questions from the book. But uh, you're welcome to ask me questions uh, as much as I can. I'll probably answer yes. So you said that you spoke with your mother um, to ask her about the <clears throat> number of, of honor killings in Afghanistan. Did she tell you the story of Nikki, or how did you come to know Nikki's story? Uh, she told me the uh, stories of Nikki, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Looks like she knew of the family of Nikki's, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. So, so in, in India, women are often killed because they don't bring in sufficient dowry. So is there any similar situation with the killing of women, let's say, in Afghanistan? Not just bringing shame, but there's some kind of economic exchange that is not honored. No. In Afghanistan, is opposite. All the, when you have a son, you should worry about the expenses for the wedding. Dowry goes the other way in Islam. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 
when a um, uh, girl, we call, actually we have dowry, but it's not the same definition. Like parents send the girl with some, uh, if, if they want, if they want. But uh, usually it's not, looks like India or even Pakistan. Yes? I uh, would like to ask you more about uh, the book, but I haven't read it yet. I just came to the first three pages of the <laughs> um, So what I saw there, um, one question you already answered, where you got the story from, so that I understand that's your mother, who, who uh, then knew directly this girl or relatives of this girl. And the, no, but the question then I have is, um, you dedicated this book to your sister. What is the story of your sister was in relation to that, or is that nothing related uh, to that? My sister is my oldest sister. She always uh, <coughs> been my uh, hero and uh, the boss of the <coughs> house and uh, a very good role model for me. And so, the, in the first question, that the, your, your mother knew this girl, or knew a relative of this girl? Um, no, yeah, she knew the uh, relative of the girl. Yeah. Yes, you want to? Okay. So, one, one yes. thing. Sorry. Like, when we see those nice pictures from the era of Zaki Shah, or women attending co-education at schools, going to record stores working as flight attendants and so on. So do they represent like how thin a layer of society, like say top 1% or say top 10%? Because mm -hmm. I'd imagine people in the villages still would live very much in the traditional ways. I mean, both the men and the females, I suppose, just going to their mother's side best and uh, wearing, you know, chadros or whatever. Yeah, uh, but they had the freedom even uh, I had relatives also in villages, uh -huh. and uh, the village girls by that time, I was very surprised because they knew about Beatles, because they were listening to the radios. Are you talking about you know, like under Mohammed Dawood or already under the People's Republic or whatever it was called? Um, I mean, was it before, before or after the revolution, of, the April Revolution of 1970? Um, before, mm -hmm. before. Yes. Like uh, Afghanistan had access to um, like radio or people had uh, uh, freely come to towns and there was not a uh, restriction to not listen to foreign radios or uh, don't talk or they were I was now I remember when uh, we had uh, relatives uh, youngers from village um, they knew about condom I didn't know and now I remember and they because they came to the clinics with oh, okay. their parents mm -hmm. and uh, uh, they really just, uh, uh, there was no, no need for them to accompany with a male companion. They just uh, uh, ride, uh, rode the bus and came to town. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to back back to something you said at the very beginning of, of, the, uh, of the talk where you mentioned uh, the case of a 11 year old uh, rape victim. Uh, you know, I'm reminded, uh, I, forgot, I first got this thought, you know, over a decade ago, when um, you know, there was lots of talk about well, the inferior, the so-called inferiority of uh, Middle Eastern or Afghan culture because of these modern killings, but then turning on the news and finding out that someone who lived in my, my town had been arrested because he poured antifreeze on his daughters because uh, they were thought she, they, he thought they were talking to boys outside of uh, out, out of their window. And my initial thought back then was if this had been a, a immigrant family from Afghanistan or or the Middle East, they would have said, oh, look, this honor killing is brought to the uh, United States, but no, it was a white American family doing it. So my question is, is, do you th is there enough of a uh, basis to separate something like an honor killing from domestic violence, general violence, which happens in the United States, to the point that we have to have a uh, CPS to help you know, police issues of that nature? I mean, is there, is there or is our honor killings, you know, is it just a kind of arbitrary thing we create for a post for a neocolonial context? Uh, it's almost the same, but just different names, just different names. Like about the 11 years g uh, girl, I said, it's American, mm -hmm. and grew up, uh, raised, uh, and just under different name. So like they don't do. call it the honor, and, uh, but sometimes uh, uh, they don't uh, uh, report it because of uh, hurt, shame of the neighbors, shame of the family. And also, as, as I said, they don't kill it. 
and uh, there are so many things happening uh, in uh, here it looks like uh, in Afghanistan but here it's well, a little different like if uh, an old man marry a young girl uh, it's all in the news uh, that man married a little young but uh, with the who was the name of that uh, playboy Magazine. <laughs> yeah, he died, but he was uh, 84 years old, and his uh, wife was 24 years old. And people didn't ask questions, but what's the difference? You know what's the difference? It was her choice. Nobody forced her. Uh, things happening, but under different circumstances and different names. So. I've, all, I've done a little research um, about honor crimes, more so in the in the Arab context of Arab countries. And in your research for this book, did you find a pattern of if if a honor crime did escalate to the point of an honor kill honor killing, did did the female victim in question did she actually do something or commit some sort of act that was perceived as bringing shame to the honor because in my readings, I found a lot of the time that it wasn't necessarily that she did anything, but the rumors of which she had done something and the damage to the reputation mm -hmm. had already been done that at that point it, it didn't matter whether she was innocent <coughs> or not and people, the family made the decision still to kill her. Exactly. Even uh, at the beginning, I said honestly, I did, I'm not an expert uh, of honor killing and I didn't uh, do any research uh, before uh, I wrote the book because uh, that was only a chapter in my uh, academic uh, book and uh, based on my uh, students' questions. But uh, this uh, question is very relevant because uh, even as a, a girl became engaged in young age, uh, in, uh, when she grew up and the boy doesn't uh, want her to marry, then it's a little damage. Yes, always damage. Girls can get damage. Yes. Is there any public outreach by the Afghan government to try to dissuade families from uh, honor killings from killing their? Uh, usually when these things happen, uh, pride of the family is come the first, but if people know outside, usually um, elder uh, people of the village uh, or town, they will uh, kind of uh, solve the problem. It doesn't report most of the time to the honor killing. And I have a video here I'd like to share with you. Uh, this is a very, very sad story. Uh, okay. I have to tell you, I'm very proud being Afghan. We, in Afghanistan, we have a beautiful, marvelous, rich uh, culture. But uh, this uh, sometimes uh, horrible um, tribal pr uh, practices happening. Um, it is uh, happening all around the world. It's not only Afghanistan because I don't want to always show something this has happened in Afghanistan. It's very important that these things happening all around the world. But since uh, I'm not from the other countries, I'm from Afghanistan, I'd like to share this and be a voice for them. Because uh, one of the other questions is uh, people are always silent. If they are silent, then who will uh, know about these topics? Well, Bibi Aisha of Afghanistan <coughs> was married off. Now, this is a very, very sad story. 19-year-old Bibi Aisha of Afghanistan was married off to some <coughs> Taliban fighter. And she didn't want to be married to him. She didn't agree to that. This was a while back now. And uh, they shipped her off to be with his family. He was out fighting in Pakistan. Then he comes back, and she decides that she's going to uh, run away because she never agreed to this and this is it, it was to settle basically a debt that her dad had by the way I mean stay classy San Diego stay classy Kandahar 
uh, you run into some debt, so you sell your daughter to the Taliban. Great move there. So since she ran away, they uh, eventually two women said they were going to help her. Instead, they tricked her, and they delivered her back into the uh, hands of her new so-called family. And guess what they decided to do to her? Uh, they cut off her nose and her ears. And be careful here. We're going to show you the picture if you're watching online. Um, it's gruesome. And uh, here is 19-year-old uh, Bibi uh, Aisha. Now, look, that's why when you know people say, let's fight the Taliban, uh, my inclination is, hell yes, let's fight the Taliban. I mean, these are serious. <coughs> You know what uh, they said, why they cut her uh, nose and ears off? And the bottom of her ears, they cut the top of the ear off. And you can obviously see if you're watching online again uh, how they cut her nose off. Uh, because she had shamed them. It appears to me that that's, the real shame here is not what she did, obviously. It's what you sick animals are doing. Now, the thing is, when I see stuff like that, it makes me want to go and kill every one of the Taliban smart. It, the natural re reaction we have is not necessarily the smart one. As we showed you in, in the previous story, sometimes when we withdraw from certain areas of uh, Afghanistan, the Taliban don't get stronger, they get weaker, because they fight with the local tribal leaders in that valley, and eventually they get displaced. Now, that doesn't mean the only answer is withdrawal, because I don't want to leave these guys in charge. And some will say it's not our battle, and that's a fair point, too. But for my purposes, what I would love to do is have a smart strategy. Do I want to protect the people that she's being helped okay. uh, by Actually, some yeah. uh, organizations, including <coughs> women for Afghan women? This program has uh, different stories from different uh, parts of the world, um, especially these things happening in Turkey, in uh, Iran in Iraq, in Bangladesh, in India, in Pakistan, in China. In, um, I came across this and I almost watched all his episodes about different uh, like uh, violence against girls and women. Okay. <clears throat> yes? While it is of course important to acknowledge that violence against women happens in every part of the world, one can only actually deal with such incidents on a national basis or on a local basis. That is, to say that violence against women happens everywhere, including Afghanistan, doesn't actually bring anyone in Afghanistan any closer to solving that problem in Afghanistan, any more than it does anywhere else in the world. So, while I can see your point about merging together, for example, the story of a child rape in the U.S. and um, a murder in Afghanistan, in that they're both violence against women, exactly. the specific causes of the violence against women in Afghanistan that you're talking about are a particular cultural construction of honor and shame. And the only way that that will ever change in Afghanistan is if Afghans themselves start thinking differently about that concept. And so I'd, I'd like to push you toward getting away from that big picture of violence against mm -hmm. women and really focusing on the question of honor killings in Afghanistan. What do Afghans currently say, think, do about this phenomenon? Is it something that disturbs Afghan society right now? Is it something that Afghans would like to see changed, or is it something that they defend as a cultural tradition? Uh, yesterday I saw another movie, Girls in the River. Have you mm -hmm. seen that? Yeah. Right. Yes. And uh, it's very hard to enlighten or teach some people who grew up with these uh, strong beliefs, but uh, gradually they are there. They will understand. And for example, this morning I had an interview about uh, uh, home schools and uh, Afghan refugee girls, and how the parents, especially in patriarchal um, communities, that uh, w men are not allowed to go to um, um, home schools, how they should know. 
And uh, the girls are supposed to demonstrate their skills of writing, reading, uh, uh, counting uh, at home. Then uh, they uh, kind of convince their fathers this is a good place to go. And they are getting enlightened, like uh, only by education, to educate them. Like, for example, uh, a story of this um, uh, uh, Nikki Zahner. And um, it is, I wrote it in English. Of course, I had uh, an editor, uh, a retired judge, uh, to e help me with editing. And now, uh, when a uh, new generation of Afghan are reading, they are telling their parents about it. And their parents uh, became so uh, interested to read it in Farsi. Now I'm trying to translate it again uh, from English to Farsi, which is much easier. Uh, and these are kind of, um, I'm kind of writing books or talking on TV. Um, this is uh, enlighten them and they're the voice for them. I'd like to kind of um, bring awareness. This is very important. But still the country is uh, poor. We don't have uh, radio, TV, newspaper, magazine um, uh, in rural area. It's, I think, it's the best uh, it's through mosques. People uh, talk, go and talk with the mullahs and imams, educate them because uh, they are the best source of information for <coughs> their, their villages. If I could, I don't know anything about Afghanistan, but uh, in countries like Jordan, for instance, the Queen Dowager, I suppose you'd call her Noor al Hussein, took this issue on and caused legislation to, because in a lot of countries, the <coughs> uh, an honor killing results in a lower charge than murder. If, if honor is involved, it's, it's used as a mitigating factor in favor of the accused. But there are moves throughout the Middle East to strengthen the laws, to remove the mitigation. Uh, in Iraq, the federal law still is that it's a mitigation, but in Iraqi Kurdistan, the mitigation was removed. So it's murder, pure and simple. The same, I think, is now true in Georgia. So there are movements, again, I can't speak specifically about Afghanistan, but throughout the uh, the Middle East, there are moves in this direction, I think. Yeah, uh, In Afghanistan, right now, we have a Ministry for Women Affairs, <coughs> and um, also we have uh, um, uh, a lady from uh, for human rights and women rights. Uh, they are fighting, and also they are working very hard to enlighten people as much as they can. Yes? You showed us the... Um pictures from uh, 70s and 50s and 60s and I think you could have shown also from other countries in that region similar pictures um, and now we have the situation where honor killings happen mm -hmm. and also where apparently it is in many of the laws it's a mitigating factor so how do you explain the development from there from the 50s, 60s, 70s where apparently at least what you showed in the picture is that this would be out of the question to force somebody and, or to kill the person just uh, there's a believed um, uh, shame on the family or something. Oh, is, is that what you're saying though? That this didn't used to happen and that's a new phenomenon? Well, maybe not. No. But you showed us I told you it's happened before Islam in those parts of the world. In but, so is there is there a difference now than in the 50s or 60s, or so this level you think no. still the same? The, the pictures was uh, were about the changing in a woman's situation, right. not about honor killing. Mm -hmm. So the situation was better at the time, or not? No, it's ex uh, I have a few stories in the book, like um, uh, the mother of Nikki was thinking, Okay, because we are villagers, it's happened. Then she remembered uh, um, when she was uh, in Kabul with her uh, relatives, she went to a funeral to a very prominent uh, person in Kabul. And there were a rumor that uh, she suicided. But actually, the close family told her it was not suicided. That prominent person killed the girl because she was uh, pregnant and she was... Uh, in love with uh, a boy at the university. It happened not only it was happening, it has been happening. It's, 
that's the reason we people are fighting to bring awareness um, to love your children like uh, a few people in uh, at the Amazon wrote some comments about my book they said uh, killing the child is more shameful but uh, have you seen that again uh, girl in the river yeah the father said no I'm very proud because Right now, when I'm walking on the streets, people says, "Okay, see that brave man wanted to kill his wife, uh, his daughter." It takes a little long time to change uh, the opinion. Right now, people are kind of prisoner of the culture, and they need to educate. They need to bring awareness. In, uh, like for example, when I see Angelina Julie came, and uh, they need uh, some people or some consultant to tell them to talk about uh, uh, those horrible practices, those horrible traditions, which will be more meaningful. And, and if you help financially people, they will listen to you more. And if that might help, yes. So the men who commit rape. Yes. It gets the women bring shame, therefore justifying, and I don't think. What happens to those men? Mm -hmm. Especially the family? ones that are repeat offenders. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. We could talk about bringing murder charges against those who kill. But what about the general culture with the men and the men who rape and, and bring about well, you, shame? Usually, uh, family will take care of that. How? Kill them. Oh, really? Yes. If they uh, rape a, a daughter, of course, they will kill him. If they caught him, they will kill him. But unless the uh, boy is a um, son of a Han or son of a warlord, of course, you cannot do anything. And also, again, I'm the, not uh, the expert uh, about honor killing. Mm, uh, I just wrote this story for my classes. And now I'm getting more experience by talking in uh, question of my audience. That's so helpful, so helpful. I'm learning, like I have uh, recorded in my mind. When I go home, I put these uh, questions and I'll study more about it. But at this moment, my uh, knowledge about honor killing uh, probably as much as you know. Yes. Can I add something about the uh, killing of the man who committed the rape? It's problematic, at least in the region. Usually the family from a tribal background, they kill only the girl. They don't care about the man. Why? Because there's revenge there. Uh -huh. If they kill the man, then his family would come after the family that killed their son. It's happening all the time. They don't care about the revenge. If they kill the boy, then revenge, they will kill them again. And the family feud will continue forever. Yeah, that's why they, they in their mindset, it's better to take care of the girl, mm -hmm. let her vanish in their culture, in their attitude. And then the boy, they usually if they do anything against the boy, then the family of the boy would come after them. Uh, no, no, it is assumption. Uh, they will uh, take care of the boy too. Yeah, unless the boy is from a powerful family. I, I give you that. I'm talking about in other areas in the region that I'm familiar with. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sometimes, I'm sorry, sometimes they do the same thing to another girl from that family or tribe. Yeah, we or call it... Sometimes also they have to marry if in the case of tribe and so they follow the Yeah, family. I have a story about, uh, we call it bad. Like, uh, if they do something wrong to the girl, then uh, the boy family is supposed to give a daughter to them. That, that's another revenge. Yes. Have any of your cultures in that part of the world gone about um, making squatters of the men? My people would take everything that was male and cut it off if they were raping the girls. Yeah. It is uh, 
different situation and different stories. You might say it's not kind of cliche. Yeah. A different uh, story, different uh, situation, and different uh, solution. The old women would be the ones who would teach the, 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 the lesson. Yeah. Because if you don't have the backing of your elders, you have nothing. Even if younger people are president or whatever, mm -hmm. if you don't have the backing of the elders, you have no power. And I presume no one in your area of the world had women rulers that could make the rules of living? That's a wonderful question. Because usually we are thinking women in Afghanistan are second-hand citizens. Not, it's not like that. Like my grandmother was a decision maker. If uh, my uncles wanted to buy a land, they had to get permission from grandmother. Grandmothers uh, had a very high position in Afghan community. And I have uh, see Afghan people, uh, they can agree with that. Yes. Yes. I have a question. I'm from India. So there are many instances of honor killing in different parts of India. And in most of the cases, it happens for like when a girl or boy is planning to marry between two different religions or castes. Mm -hmm. So uh, what happens generally, the girl's family kills the girl. And the, and the killing due to dowry happens because of do, uh, domestic violence post marriage, and it is not considered as honor killing because the shame is brought to the groom's family then. But in all of these cases, the jurisdiction plays an important role. So, does this happen in Afghanistan too, like in the honor killing cases? What role does the jurisdiction play, or the police, or the court plays in it? Uh, the legal role, I guess. Yeah, uh, if they report it, and um, they probably persecute it, but if they don't, usually they don't report it. Um, yeah, I'm not talking uh, in general, uh, based on uh, my experience and talking, uh, they usually don't report. No. I'm very fortunate because uh, I have relatives in Kabul and also I have relatives <coughs> in villages. I'm pretty much familiar. In, um, if something happened in uh, this small village, police never knew about that. Mm -hmm. Family would take care of it. And they didn't even, doesn't matter, the boy was a Han's uh, son or a warlord, uh, they went after the boy too. Yeah. This is my experience from my little village. Yes. Is your book <coughs> translated into your language? Uh, my book to which language? Farsi. To Farsi. Farsi. Um, that was, I just said, uh, you know, the new generation of students who are Afghan, they read it and told their ma mothers or aunts or sisters. And uh, they wanted to uh, see it in Farsi. Right now I'm trying to translate it back to Farsi. Oh. Yes. Yes. Um, so here in the U.S. we have astonishing levels of spousal violence. Domestic violence, um, even killing of your spouse, but it's not often framed as honor killing. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering that in your research or experience, have you ever compared those those two phenomena together? Uh, yeah, um, I just uh, came across a word is jealousy here. Like if a um, husband see uh, a father. Um, usually, g boyfriends see the girlfriend talks to another person or have an affair with another person. They kill it. It's uh, um, it is more kind of jealousy. Uh, but uh, it's hundreds, hundreds uh, cases, and it's very hard to classify them. And there's never any punishment for the killers. It's depend. It's depend. So it's just basically left to the community to decide. Family community. Yes, I'm just talking because I don't talk uh, in general. Yeah. I'm just talking about and uh, narrow it down to my own experience of the uh, family, <coughs> or, um, either family in village or family in town. Yes. I come from a plan. I know. 
So was Nikki's honor based on only one story, or were there multiple? Are there multiple stories brought together in the book? Yes, it's multiple stories. Uh, it's a story, a stories, uh, and within a story. But is, but the story of Nikki herself is that actually like all the experiences are actually true for her? They're not like pieces of multiple stories that you've heard. No, it's uh, together. multiple it's stories. Yeah, like for example, in one uh, part. Uh, yeah, when Nikki's mother is uh, looking at uh, her daughter's belly and she's thinking about uh, <coughs> like, uh, so much of, of girls were unfortunate, but some of the girls, they didn't get to be killed or something. And uh, her wish was if Nikki doesn't get killed. Yes. And then she was remembering in her mind the stories and I told these stories. With that, it's can we uh, thank you very much for a fascinating hour. Thank you very much. <laughs>